I've interviewed a lot of experts recently, like Dr. Peter Atia, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, Dr. Tommy Wood, Dr. Gabby Lyon, Mark Sisson, just to name a few, and almost every single one of them have sort of abandoned their practice of fasting. They're no longer big fans of fasting. But if you dive into the nitty gritty of it, which we're going to do, we're gonna break down each of their little chunks of these interviews, don't worry, it's not gonna be long and drawn out, to kind of investigate why they're changing their mind on fasting, we can put it all together and find sort of the common denominators. All these different experts, respected, credible experts in their respective fields, they all seem to kind of agree on the same thing and it's kind of interesting. So we'll break down these little clips and we'll talk about what we can do to potentially fix the issue and gonna end with some really cool tips from Dr. Tommy Wood on how to preserve muscle if you're fasting and even if you're not fasting. After today's video, I put a link down below for Create Creatine Gummies. They are a sponsor on this channel. They have been for a while and these are allulose sweetened creatine gummies. So very, very little sugar, just enough sugar to kind of help the creatine delivery. Otherwise sweetened with allulose, so not getting a bunch of calories and extra sugar in. One and a half grams of creatine per gummy. So you can low dose your creatine. And as I've talked about with other experts on my channel, creatine is one of the most powerful ways to increase your overall energy and your strength. Hugely recognized and one of the most studied ergogenic aids that's out there. So that is a 50% off discount link. That gets you a huge discount on these creatine create gummies. So again, that link down below, you can low dose so you don't get as much water retention. It's awesome. So top line of the description underneath this video and a big thank you to them for supporting this channel. So first, Dr. Rhonda Patrick. I'm gonna to cut to a clip where she talks about no longer skipping breakfast and why she's no longer doing that. She's no longer fasting. So Dr. Patrick, take it away. Probably one of the biggest things I've changed my mind on over the past few years is um, my stance on meal skipping, skipping a meal. And um, somehow this has become synonymous with intermittent fasting. Like people, when they think about intermittent fasting, they think about skipping meal. And it's not, that's not intermittent fasting, so to speak, right? I mean, intermittent fasting is really, there's different types of it. And it has to do with like having a period of time without having food intake. Um, but the, when I say specifically meal skipping, I think mostly it's skipping breakfast. And I think that's actually what a lot of people do end up doing when they are quote unquote, trying to practice intermittent fasting. So that's kind of interesting. She really was a big fan of fasting before. In fact, she even talked about it, I think on Rogan and stuff. But now let's talk about Dr. Peter Atia because he's really pivoted on things. So much so that he's kind of pissed some people off, but I really admire his ability to change with science. And in this particular case, he talks about how he changed his views on prolonged sort of regular fasting. So Dr. Peter Atia. The first one that I would say I've changed my mind on is the importance of regular fasting. Um, so I used to really do a lot of regular fasting, um, probably considered excessive by, by some. Um, so probably did a seven day, seven to 10 day water only fast once a quarter and a three day water only fast once a month. And um, I think while there were clearly some benefits of doing that, um, I think, you know, it's very difficult to measure what's happening cellularly, but my belief at least was that the benefits of that outweighed the downside. I found this very powerful because he was a huge proponent of fasting for a long time. It was a little bit of a shocker to a lot of people. And then we have Brad Kearns. I know I didn't mention him earlier on, but Brad Kearns is a pro triathlete that used to do a ton of fasting. He and Mark Sisson were like big in fasting and he's talked about how it's too stressful. So I'll cut to a short clip here about stress and recovery. One thing that comes to mind is um, the, the popularity of this uh, restrictive dietary strategies today, fasting, keto, carb restriction, calorie restriction, time restricted feeding, all these things that are um, presented as having health boosting benefits. And of course they, they do validate that, but there's a certain segment of people who have dove into this uh, and kind of form this restrictive mindset in the name of health but they're putting too much stress 
into their lifestyle mix again. All these things are possible to go do your CrossFit workout and then come home and fast for three more hours and then have a ketogenic meal and then wake up and do it again. It's possible, but I'm gonna argue that it's not necessarily optimal to add the stress of fasting and keto to a stressful workout. So I've kind of rethought my dietary strategy these days to just fuel myself with as much nutritious food as possible. Dr. Tommy Wood, one of the great leaders that we respect in ancestral health, he told me this many years ago. It took a while to kick in, but he said, for healthy athletic people like you, Brad, I want you eating as much nutritious food as possible every day until you gain a pound of body fat and then you turn it down. And that's when you realize you're optimal, that you're eating so much that you're actually adding body fat from nutritious intake of eggs and steak and liver and smoothies and tons of fruit and all the things that are now the centerpiece of my diet. Now, when you look at the big picture and you look at this, almost every single person that I've talked to has talked about fasting being problematic because it's hard to get enough protein. So now I wanna address some of the interviews that I've done with some of these same guests that are talking about the importance of protein. And we can kind of connect the dots here that the issue with fasting isn't fasting itself, it's the fact that people typically aren't getting protein in. So let's investigate this. Here's Dr. Rhonda Patrick talking about how she's realized how important protein is for longevity. Why I've changed my mind, I, on, I used to, often skip breakfast myself. And um, I think as new data has come out and as I've talked to a lot of experts on muscle protein synthesis and like Stu Phillips, for example, Brad Schoenfeld, I have, I've come to this, this um, conclusion that, you know, not getting enough protein in that really important meal after you've been fasting all night you know, we don't store amino acids. We don't store them like we do. We store glycogen for glucose. You know, we store fat in, you know, you know, adipose tissue, triglycerides. We don't store amino acids. We need a constant source of it. And we, when we don't get amino acids, um, we start to experience muscle breakdown. And so it's always a balance between muscle protein synthesis and breakdown, right? And there's two signals for muscle protein synthesis. Protein intake, specifically has to do with essential amino acids like leucine being a major one. That, si that signal mu muscle protein synthesis. And then the other signal is mechanical stress, right? So just resistance training essentially, right? The, the forces like mechanically like stressing your muscles, right? Um, so that first meal breakfast is so important because you're essentially at the point where you, you need protein. And so you get into this sort of catabolic, um, you know, state if you're not getting protein at that point. This was powerful coming from her because I actually wasn't expecting her to be super high protein. As a matter of fact, she'd even said before that she wasn't super high protein and now she's started to make a concerted effort to add more protein in. And then now we go to Dr. Peter Atia. He mentions specifically that the downsides of fasting, the fact that he was losing muscle. He personally lost muscle when he was fasting and he realized that that had a more detrimental effect on his longevity. So he sort of abandoned fasting as a regular practice, at least a prolonged fasting, because he didn't want to lose muscle. And it makes sense, so check this out. The downside of doing that, by the way, is you're gonna lose a lot of muscle mass. Um, you, you know, as much as you might exercise during those periods of fasting, which I tried to, uh, you know, you're just not going to be able to maintain lean mass. So you, you basically, I was always sort of accumulating a little bit of a debt of lost muscle mass. And over a period of about three years, I probably lost about 10 pounds of lean mass. Um, and so today I just don't feel that that trade-off is worthwhile, at least at that extreme level. And then you have Dr. Gabby Lyon. I adore her, she is awesome. And she comes right out and she says that it is probably more dangerous to lose muscle than it is to gain fat, within reason, of course. Now, this is an interesting clip and you can kind of see like, this could take some people aback. They could think, okay, well, muscle mass is important, but how much fat I have on me is probably even more important. She tends to disagree. It looks like muscle mass doesn't matter. It looks like strength is the only thing that matters. But there is some literature by a man named William Evans, and he has come out with something called, him and a few of his colleagues have come out with something called D3 creatine. And this is a way of tagging skeletal muscle because creatine is taken up by skeletal muscle 
that, that you can actually begin to directly measure skeletal muscle mass. And what they found is that it is much more um, dangerous to have a loss of skeletal muscle than it is to have an increase in fat. Then you have Mark Sisson. I know he's not a doctor, but he's well-respected in his field and he's well-respected as an athlete. And he talks about how now he's changed his diet to be much more protein-centric. He used to be more about, oh, let me just have my quote-unquote big salad, which was Mark's sort of staple thing. Wasn't worried too much about protein. Now everything else is a garnish. Protein is the focus. But it does mean that I'm much more protein-centric. So most of what I focus my diet on is am I getting a minimum of 120 grams of protein a day. And in, in the appropriate uh, doses and time spans that at least over a period of, say, any, any measured time of three or four days, within those three or four days, I've averaged 120 or averaged 140 grams a day. But it's, it always comes down to what's, what's the protein focus of the meal I'm about to consume. So that's been the real um, major like strategic move I've done as I've, as I've turned 70 and, and want to maintain as much muscle mass as I can through the next, certainly the next decade, but possibly the next two decades. Now this next guest is really interesting because this is someone that you would never have expected to say this, especially in the last five years. He's one of the most anti-fasting people ever. And then he comes in blindsides me and is like, actually, fasting can be decent for building muscle. And that's Dr. Lane Norton. So he comes in, he's like, actually, intermittent fasting can be perfectly fine for building muscle as long as protein needs are met. So check this out from Lane Norton, the guy that people love to hate. So I did change my mind about fasting as well from the perspective of, you know, 10 years ago, if you asked me about fasting, I'd say, well, you know, I don't think it's a good idea for people who want to build muscle because, you know, we've shown that even an, uh, an overnight fast will depress muscle protein synthesis. And so now if you're extending that out further, you know, I don't know if you're gonna be able to make up for this. There's been a couple studies now out of Grant Tinsley's lab um, where I think he's at Texas A&M where they've done, you know, I think it's eight to 12 week resistance training studies where people either do kind of your traditional 16, eight intermittent fasting uh, with resistance training, or they do continuous feeding, and they've shown no differences in the accrual of lean tissue. So a couple caveats to that, eight to 12 weeks, not a super long time, not saying it's a bad study, it's not a bad study at all, but you know, differences in muscle mass are slow. Yeah. So if you, we kind of were talking about this earlier, if you inject me with true serum and ask me, do I think that, you know, of any form of fasting is optimal if you want to be the most muscular person you possibly can be, no, but that's not most people either, yeah. right? If you're just worried about growing muscle and you know staying lean and you find that intermittent fasting is a useful tool for that, you can absolutely still build muscle intermittent fasting, especially if you're getting enough protein, getting enough total calories. And the one thing I will say about this study was they made sure they had them train during their feeding window and they did advise them to get like three good servings of protein in. Peter Atia makes a really good point about intermittent fasting, which, you know, on a practical level, he said, you know, I have seen people kind of start to lose lean mass on intermittent fasting, but it's since we're compressing their feeding window, they tend to just eat less protein. They tend to eat kind of like a similar diet they normally would just less. And so, you know, if lean mass is a, is a consideration, you know, if you're narrowing your feeding window, you do want to make sure you're getting, you know, a couple of, you know, high quality protein doses in if again, lean mass is a consideration, but I have changed my tune that, okay, 16, eight intermittent fasting doesn't seem to be significantly different from kind of regular feeding if you're getting enough protein. So after hearing that, it's like, okay, this gives us hope, right? This gives us hope that even Lane Norton is saying like, okay, yeah, fasting, you could still build muscle. So you've got all these people that saying, I don't wanna lose muscle with fasting, so they stop fasting. And then you have Lane coming in and saying like, actually, no, like, I mean, if you wanna fast, fast, just get enough protein. But how much protein? Well, back to Dr. Rhonda Patrick, she has a pretty scientific explanation to how much protein we should be consuming. And she really backs it up with some good literature. No, no, so 0 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight is the RDA. It's it's more like 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight is is what's just needed to like not lose muscle mass. Wow. Um, which is a lot higher than the RDA. 
And then when you talk about training and stuff, you can go maybe even a little bit above that, up yeah. to like two grams per kilogram body weight. Okay, so we heard that from Dr. Rhonda Patrick. Then there's also a quick clip from Dr. Gabby Lyon, who has a similar view with a slightly different number, but still close as far as how much protein we should aim to get. Now, this seems to be the case, whether you're fasting or not, aim for this amount of protein. So when it comes to longevity, you have to protect skeletal muscle at all costs. The data between dietary protein and skeletal muscle, that is very clear. Right now, our recommendation is 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight, which is 0.37 grams of dietary protein per one pound. The data shows that double the RDA has a much better effect on aging muscle. Um, and so that's it. at least, you know, you're looking at 1.6 grams per kg. Okay, so we've determined basically 1.6 to 2 grams per kilogram of body weight. Personally, I aim for a little over 1 gram per pound of body weight. I err on the side of caution. I would rather just make it easy, say I'm 185 pounds, I'm going to go for about 200 grams of protein, sometimes even more. And now one of my favorite people in the space, Dr. Tommy Wood, he talks about a few tips that you could apply to your life to build muscle, even if you are fasting. If you do intermittent fasting, um, so, so I guess it depends on, on the length, right? If, if, your, if your fast is you know, less than 24 hours or up to 24 hours, you know, whether or not you exercise on that day or do resistance training on a day may not matter that much. During, you know, prolonged fast, I think, you know, resistance, resistance training during the fast is, is important. And then what are the other important things for gaining uh, muscle mass? Adequate calorie intake, especially um, protein intake. Um, and so you're probably talking 1.6, 1.8, maybe 2 uh, grams per, per kilo of target body weight um, if you want to get super specific. So adequate stimulus um, and then you know, adequate protein. Collectively, when you look at this, you find the common denominator is people that are fasting aren't eating enough. Eat enough and fasting can be a perfect tool for you to stay lean, stay in the shape that you want to stay in, and also even build muscle, let alone maintain it. As always, keep it locked to here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.